This is a recording of the January 14, 2023 meetup of the NMRA PCR Coast Division. This meetup was done with the PSR Arizona Division and features a clinic by Phil at home on 3D printing wall framing for an O scale building. Well, welcome everyone. This is the uh, Saturday morning Coast Division virtual event, which this week is combined with the Arizona Division and uh, some members, other members of the Pacific Southwest as well. Um, so why don't, before I start, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the coast. Um, the Coast Division is the Bay Area um, in uh, California, basically the, the, the counties you would think of as the Bay Area and kind of the south side of the Bay Area. Um, and uh, why don't Bruce, I show over you, you can introduce us to the Arizona division. Okay, Phil, thanks uh, for having us. Um, we, we kind of put this together at the last minute because of some schedule conflicts. And uh, we've been trying to get this, this clinic out to the Arizona group for about a year and through screw ups on my part and other, other directions, we've uh, uh, lost it off a couple times. But by golly, we're, we're going to do it today. Uh, we're the Arizona Division, which is part of the Pacific Southwest region. And um, prior to my joining the NMRA, it was all one uh, region, and then it got split up, the two, the Pacific Coast and the Pacific Southwest, I understand. But I don't know that history from personal experience. The Arizona Division is the entire state of Arizona. Uh, we are the largest division of the PSR both in terms of uh, membership and in terms of land area because it's the, the entire state. So uh, we have about 340 members, something like that within Arizona. And uh, a, a, good, uh, a good group of folks here. Um, and even at least one uh, snowbird, if you will, someone who's, who's not normally resident here, but is here at this point in time. Uh, but he's, he's from Mississippi. so. He's, and he's up in, in Winslow, so he's, he is here and he's getting snow, but that's a different thing, uh, Gerald Mabry. And uh, so uh, that's, and we have the, the, I guess, the presidents of both regions here today and uh, uh, just an interesting group. And I think we're going to have a, going to have a good time and have a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share real quick again. Uh, this is kind of, we do a switch list every, every week when we, every couple of weeks we have a meeting. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some upcoming events in the Coast Division. Um, Bruce will talk a little bit about the upcoming PSR convention. Um, then we're going to do the clinic, um, which is on the concept of using 3D printing for print framing for buildings. And then, and then we'll go back to just kind of a little bit of sharing what you're modeling and talking about what, about kind of what's going, what people are doing. Um, so very quickly, I wanted to just, this is for, again, the Coast folks, remind everyone um, there is a uh, estate sale for the Howard Lloyd estate this afternoon. That's 12 to 3. Um, it'll be at Bob Brown's house in Los Altos. Um, if you didn't see the email, I haven't updated what I have here. Um, there was an email from, um, from Earl. Um, Bob, Bob indicated he found a whole bunch of things he decided he didn't want. Um, a whole bunch of old models from the Gazette days and other stuff. So he sent out some pictures. So um, if you need a little more incentive to go down and check it out, it sounds like Bob is selling off a bunch of stuff as well. So that probably will be very interesting. Um, I'll put the, after I get done here, I'll put the, uh, the address up in the chat if anyone's interested. Um, and if you want to, you can contact Earl um, if you have any questions. So that's this afternoon. By the way, if you do go and see Bob, wish him a happy 90th birthday since it's his 90th birthday um, right around now. Um, so Sorry. So these are the upcoming events. Um, over the next few weeks, we've got some great events happening. Uh, next week's the Great Train Show. Um, the Sierra Division is looking for some help manning an NMRA table at the Great Train Show, especially on Saturday. Um, if you can help with that, um, let me know. I will uh, put you in touch with, with Dave Putnam, who's managing that. If you volunteer at the table, you get free admission to the event. We've got some free tickets. Um, next weekend is the Bay Area SIG meet. Um, that'll be at the Golden State Model Railroad Museum in Richmond. Um, it starts Friday afternoon with a tour of the Richmond Railroad. Saturday will be clinics and interactions, and Sunday will be some operating sessions. Um, 
On February 11th, we're going to join the um, Sierra Division. They have set up uh, to do a tour at the NMRA exhibit and the California State Railroad Museum. Um, if you give me your name or you go online, um, those who anybody who gets the Coast Division Extra, there's a link in there to a Google form. You can put your name and email in. Um, if you do that, either send it to me or do that, you will get free admission to the Railroad Museum. Um, Charlie Getz um, has agreed to at two o'clock do another tour of the uh, the NMRA exhibit. We did this as a Coast Division trip back um, about a year and a half ago, um, and it was simply brilliant because um, obviously Charlie has a, a lot of attachment to the exhibit there and was involved in curating a lot of the things that went into the exhibit and could talk about where they came from, et cetera. Um, so we'll be on Capitol Corridor train 724 going up. Um, so if you're interested, just get a ticket on the train. Um, we'll probably we'll find, we'll find a car and send some messages out if we know who's, who's there of which car we're in. Um, we are trying to set up on February 18th. This needs to be closed exactly what the schedule will be to go to the Carquinez Model Railroad Society. They're doing an operating session. This will not be to operate per se, but to kind of observe and talk to them about their operating session, what goes into it. So for folks who are interested in operations, it's an opportunity to, to kind of see what's, what's going on there. Um, the convention is the PSR convention or PCR... <laughs> PCR convention is at the Marriott in Sacramento on April 26th to 30th. So go ahead and get, um, go, go ahead and get um, set up for that. Um, we are confirmed for March 21st for a coast auction at the Mastic Center in Alameda. Um, that's where we did the last one. It'll be at the same location. And I think that should be a, a really good auction at that point. And then, of course, August 20th to 26th is the NMRA National Convention in Garland, Texas. Um, so I thought I'm going to throw it back over to Bruce and let Bruce talk about the PSR convention. Thank you, Phil. I'm going to take a little, a little more than what you're offering because I'll talk about a few events here that I don't have, you don't have on your uh, uh, cool. slides there. But the first thing is our, our uh, PSR convention, rather than being in September this year, is going to be in June in Flagstaff. Uh, this is a time for a... Um, <clears throat> absolute bucket list kind of railroad trip. It will be steam only to the on the Grand Canyon Railway from Williams to uh, the Grand Canyon and back with a, a photo run by. And I say steam only, there will not be a diesel helper in the consist. Right now the consist is the steam locomotive and four cars. Each car is a different class. The two most expensive classes are already sold out. We have about half the room left in the other two. We can add car a car if we need to, uh, but we have to do all of that before April 1st. So uh, if you're at all interested in that, and it is the, that is the convention is open to NMRA members from anywhere. Uh, the train is open to NMRA members and their personal guests. So if you have friends that would like to, uh, to ride that train, more than welcome to come. They don't have to, uh, have a convention registration to uh, to sign up for the train, so it's uh, it's going to be quite a deal. We're going to have a little different uh, timing and layout uh, on the convention from what we usually do. We'll have clinics on Thursday and Friday, and uh, in every clinic slot, at least one of the clinics will be related to Northern Arizona, uh, the Grand Canyon, geology, uh, Native people, uh, that sort of thing, uh, and. Uh, we're we're also looking at at some clinics about some of the more obscure northern arizona railroads and and that sort of thing uh so it's uh it's that's going to be a, a a really a really interesting convention and um the <coughs> excuse me the way it's set up we're uh we have rooms reserved at the drury hotel which is uh in conjunction with the um high country uh, convention center there in, in Flagstaff. So um, the room rate is like a hundred about $175 a night, but that includes their breakfast buffet and their happy hour, which is three drinks and ha uh, heavy hors d'oeuvres. And we're going to bring in lunch. So basically you shouldn't have to spend a, a penny for, uh, for uh, food other than uh, the, the banquet on Saturday night. So 
um, it gets it gets much more reasonable when you look at it that way for two people in a room. So that's the the convention. Uh, upcoming things on February eighteenth, we'll have our third third Saturday meet like this on Zoom, and Pat McCarthy from the Southeast region is going to talk about railroad timepieces. I've seen part of what he has to to um, to share here, and it's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend it if you're not going to the uh, the ops uh, uh, meet there that you're having in the uh, in the P uh, in the Coast Division. Uh, come on by and uh if you're interested um you'll need to get a zoom uh link that won't be uh, i can i can i'll tell you what i'll put it in the chat later on today uh so that you, everybody has has access to that link then march 11th is our in-person division meet here in the uh the Phoenix area is. and march 18 and march 18th is uh the Saguaro Central swap meet and uh, train meet at uh, the Adobe Mountain Railroad Park. So that's it. And uh, one more thing, since uh, Phil, uh, since Phil um, talked about the Texas Express uh, Convention, uh, I worked I worked on the committee for about a year and then just got overwhelmed with stuff and and had to uh, and most of what I was working on had been taken care of anyhow. So uh, I, I've been watching the, in, the inside of getting that co convention going, and it's been absolutely amazing. I think people are going to really, really get a, a, a good time there. So uh, that's what we've got. Super. Uh, thanks, Bruce. That was greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we, we probably need to do a better job of, we should think about this, is how to communicate these kind of events between the regions and divisions. That's uh, an interesting thought process. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into uh, the clinic here. So again, I'll pause for a second. Um, we, do, we do record this, this is being recorded. We put it up on our Coast Division site and we put the clinics up there. So I'll pause for a moment. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Phil Edholm. Um, this is a clinic about using 3D printing specifically filament printing to do building framing. Um, this clinic was actually done originally for the, um, the, PS, PC, the PCR convention last year. Um, and we'll kind of reprise it here, but actually moved a little bit farther along with the construction than we're at in May. So a little bit further along. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, these are a couple of pictures that were taken actually right before the May convention. Um, I haven't actually replicated these yet because I haven't gotten quite to, I'll explain to the end of finishing the interior of the building, um, but it gives you an idea of kind of what you can recreate with uh, 3D printing. Um, in this case, what you're seeing is the wall framing is 3D printed. Um, everything else, the wood, the floor, the, the little, um, little raised platform there at the back, the siding is all real wood stained. Um, so it's a combination of the 3D printing and the staining. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how you do that in a way to make it actually so you can't really tell where the wood ends and the plastic begins. Um, the roof, by the way, you can see a little bit here in the roof is um, all the trusses are 3D printed. And we'll go through how that's done. Um, and then the roofing is put on on top of those. And you'll, you'll see when we get to the roof, the roof is actually a single unit that you can pick up and with one hand and move around. It's actually incredibly solid. Um, so with that, uh, let me talk very briefly about myself. I'm a actually a fairly recent model railroader. I did some model railroading in the 90s, had a layout built in a spare bedroom, um, change of job to a position where I traveled about 80% about of the time, combined with a house move where we didn't have a place to build a layout at the time. Uh, man, I tore the layout and went through the emotionally debilitating path of, of not having a layout for a while. Um, in about 2014, 15, I got back into the hobby. Um, I started off with some modular railroading, a, a group called the California Central Coast. It's an ON30 group, um, does different, different events here around the Bay Area. Um, and I'm part of the Alameda County Central Railroad, which is in Pleasanton, which is a combination of an HO and an O-scale layout and do a lot of the modeling there. I focus there on the O-scale 
Uh, the Osco layout needed a lot of work, and so doing a lot of rebuilding there. Um, just some examples of some of the things I've done. These are primarily in the ON3 space. Um, started off modeling kind of, I had a very Sierra bent. Um, and as I've gotten more into it, I've gotten much more focused on the uh, coast of California. So on the lower left, that's actually a two by four foot module that is a reasonably accurate, photographically accurate model of the uh, Mission Hill Tunnel in, Santa, in uh, Santa Cruz. That's where the Mission of Santa Cruz is on top of a tunnel that was built. That tunnel is actually still used by the uh, tourist railroad that runs from Felton down to the coast, the Roaring Camp Railroad. Um, and the right is actually, a, not again, a two by four module that is a recreation of the Wilder Ranch siding. Wilder Ranch is just north of Santa Cruz. So I'm kind of trying to recreate areas on the coast. Um, what happened was I was building a new module. We needed to build some new modules. And two things kind of occurred that drove this. Um, the first was I bought a, an Ender 3 printer almost right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, Turns out you're buying in a printer for $212, including a kilogram of filament. And I thought, gee, this is a pretty good thing to get into this 3D printing thing. I should try it. Um, engineer by background, so the CAD stuff doesn't really scare me that much. Um, and at the same time, um, Earl Gerbevon, who uh, is a recent MMR in the Coast Division, was showing a lot of his work. And I, I really began to be um, very much focused on you know, how do I create similar levels of things? Um, so the club that I'm part of, we had some changes. Um, two of our members, um, one member had a, a heart attack and had a stroke and actually had some major issues with getting around and decided to not participate in modular events anymore. Um, another group is a couple. The husband had a lot of health issues and they've stopped participating. Between them, we lost about 15 fairly highly um, detailed and fairly large modules. So um, we needed to have a bunch of, of, of new modules to uh, to basically build out. Some of the shows we do are fairly large where we're in a 50 by 70 foot space, typically have 70 to 100 modules. Um, one of the other things we, we started doing was operations and wanted to do something that was more operational um, and creating some new scenes. Um, some Some logic in terms of what I wanted to build um, I wanted to do a harbor scene. Um, I was very much um, saw the Smuggler's Cove and the idea of that. Um, that turned into a California scene, which is a little different than East Coast. Um, I wanted at least one ship. I wanted to do the Frenchman Model Works car float. Uh, I wanted to appear in a warehouse. And I wanted to have at least 12 switch spots on the, on the module. Um, so a bunch of designs, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of the result. So. Uh, this is actually what the design looks like. So we are, our modules are all two feet wide, six inch entry point on one end. This is ON30, um, which you can see is kind of a through track with a crossing. Um, and this actually replicates pretty closely as you're going to see um, what you'd see in Moss Landing if you went to Moss Landing in California today. Um, and there's kind of an assumption here, I've spent a lot of time on it, that the uh, harbor was reopened in the 1915 time frame. After the earthquake in 1906, the river moved and Moss Landing actually silted up. And it was then reopened in the 50s as a fishing harbor. Um, this assumes that that dredging happened much earlier. Um, what you see on the bottom is a fairly recent, this was probably taken about three months ago, um, view of the module the way it is today. Um, and as you'll see some pictures, I'm really trying to recreate that feel of the California coast at the time. Um, this is actually kind of the, the logic of the module. Um, you kind of see the module on the far right. Um, what you see on the left is actually the, uh, the diagram of Moss Landing. Um, what you see in the center is actually where this module would have been if you lay it over the ground. Um, the uh, the Pajaro Valley Railroad is actually the railroad that if you look on the left, you'll see there's railroad and there's actually the Pajaro Valley Railroad ran right along Moss, Moss Landing. And if you notice over on the far left, you can kind of see there's a pier that goes out in the ocean. So kind of the assumption here is that this was dredged open. Instead of having a pier out into the ocean, there were wharves built along the, uh, along the way here uh, in front of what's now that's uh, 
that's the area where if you go, it's the now a Duke power, it used to be a PG&E power plant um, is actually built there. So essentially trying to, to create that the module actually replicates something in the real world. Um, these are a whole bunch of the pictures of that area, circa 1906. Um, one of the brilliant things about 1906, the 1906 earthquake is, it turns out that lots of people took lots of pictures in 1906. Um, so the upper left picture, if you look at that, that's actually taken from the land side across that spit of water to the sandbar between the spit of water and the ocean. So that's actually looking across the railroad bridge. Um, you're actually standing on the switch that leads to the Y that comes to that bridge. Um, what you see is there's a, a road bridge to the left, the railroad bridge to the right. Um, and you can kind of see some of the buildings and kind of the layout of the land at that time. Um, the upper right picture, uh, the other pictures here, by the way, are the other structures, the Hovden refinery on the lower left, uh, or Hovden cannery is actually the cannery building that I'm gonna be building there. Um, there's a scene I'll show you in a, a, later on that's a, uh, the um, standard oil fuel pier. Um, so I tried to recreate some scenes from the California coast. Um, specifically for this building, this building was intended to be a warehouse the picture on the upper right is actually looking back from the sandbar side back towards the mainland side across Mass Landing. And what you see was they had these fairly large warehouses there that were involved with the shipping in and out of the pier. So what I'm really trying to do is recreate that, that structure. So when you look at the structure and the design of the structure, you'll see it, it pretty much follows that. Um, the way I tend to do mock-ups and designs, I use PowerPoint. Um, I found PowerPoint, if you just look at it as a simple, cheap drawing package, works out pretty well. So what you see here are some pictures of the design of the buildings done in PowerPoint, um, along with a whole bunch of other images and things. I kind of gather everything up into one big PowerPoint deck when I do a project like this. So I have it all in one point. So if you kind of look on there, you can see on the upper row some of the slides you already saw in terms of locations, et cetera. Um, within the constraints of, you know, obviously a 12 foot long by three foot four inch module, um, a building is fairly large at 20 inches by eight inches. So that ended up being my kind of design, design size for the building. So within that 20 by eight inches, I was trying again to replicate that feel of those long, low warehouse buildings with that um, kind of gabled center doors on the sides, et cetera. So this was kind of the design that, that I was working on. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how this works into the modules themselves. Um, one of the things I decided to do on this layout was make all the buildings removable. Um, probably could have done this with magnets. And if I do it again today, I might think about doing it with magnets instead of the way I did it. Um, the way it was done though was, as you can see in the upper center picture, there were boxes built onto the, the base layout, then everything was surrounded with foam because I've got about two and a quarter inches from the rail height to the water height. Um, and those boxes were built with actually a wood piece that fit down inside them fairly tightly. Um, then after that was done, each one with those was connected to a piece of masonite. And so the idea was to actually build the buildings on the masonite. And as I went through this process of thinking about building removal buildings, one of the thoughts was, well, how do you make those buildings very um, strong? And that led to a thought process that said, let me build all these buildings out of acrylic boxes. Um, so this is actually two of those buildings. Um, the one that's close, if you look at the bottom left picture, the one that's closest is what I refer to as the transfer building. That's actually a building that's got a track that goes inside and was intended to be where other things were shipped. The back building is the warehouse. Um, the warehouse actually in this model is intended to be a place where um, the uh, where sugar was shipped. Um, so Spreckles um, actually was the um, the sugar company that created be a beet refinery in Salinas. Um, they had an ongoing war with the SP about SP rates because the sh raw sugar was produced down there. And then it would ship to San Francisco to a refinery in San Francisco where the raw sugar was turned into consumable sugar, you know, white sugar, powdered sugar, et cetera. And in order to do that, they had to ship it on the uh, SP. Um, the reason they built railroads like the Parra Valley was to avoid the SP. 
So kind of the, the logic of this, uh, this whole module is that the, the sugar company ships everyday sugar to the warehouse. It's put in the warehouse, then a ship comes in. They transload the, the sugar onto the ship. It goes around through the, uh, the Golden Gate up to the sugar refinery up by San Francisco, actually up by Carquinez. And so that's the justification for the warehouse. Because of that, you have to be able to get a lot of, essentially a lot of traffic through the warehouse quickly. So if you look at it, the warehouse has on one, on both sides, it has tracks, it has tracks on the dock, it has back tracks, it has doors. And the idea was that the warehouse would shove sugar in it. So this was kind of the place that I was at. And I started building the building that's the transfer building. Um, at the time I did the clinic in May, that building was, was a, a ways along. Um, over the past month, I've really gotten it done. So the center picture is actually kind of a picture of that building. Uh, that's actually an acrylic box. Um, when you look through those windows and the pictures that you see through the windows of the interior, you're looking through eighth inch plexiglass, eighth inch acrylic. Um, and it's just sheathed on both sides. You can kind of see on the center picture there. If you look down on the bottom, you can see that it's plexiglass in the middle, sheathed on both sides with wood. Uh, again, a very, uh, very solid, solidly built building. Um, so I, again, I, I had this laser printer and I started using the laser printer. The, the scene on the right is that dock scene, kind of my initial mock of it with a mock-up building. Um, and I started doing the roof for that, that transit building, um, that transfer building. And, and it was, if you look at the roof, the roof is basically two pieces of acrylic. They're gusseted together. You see little gussets on the ends. When I realized people could look through the doors and could look up, I needed to have some trusses. So I sat there, looked at the 3D printer and said, gee, I can 3D print some trusses. So I 3D printed some trusses. I 3D printed some channels. I put the lights in it. And while I was doing that, I was sitting and looking at that building next to it and saying, well, maybe I don't need to use acrylic. Maybe I can actually think about 3D printing the walls for that building. Because the 3D printing, if you do you know, a six inch, a six by six, and print that as a 3D printed hybrid, it's an eighth of an inch thick, which is the same thickness as the, th the plexiglass that the building box was. So that led to taking that design of the building and saying, how could you 3D print that? Um, so it turns out uh, the print bed is 200 millimeters. That's about eight inches. So you can print an eight inch piece. So I looked at this building that again is 20 inches long and realized if you break it up into six inch, eight inch and six inch pieces, you can actually cast the whole, you can actually 3D print the whole wall. So what I started doing then was taking the design, the, the basic design, which really was never much more finalized in PowerPoint than you see here, and actually designing that architecturally using the 3D print, the 3D print method. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on CAD because um, quite frankly, uh, if you're looking at doing this and you're going to do primarily model railroading and you're not a, an engineer who's got a lot of drafting experience, I kind of would recommend Tinkercad. Um, Fran Foley's on here. Fran did a Tinkercad clinic and he's committed to me. He's going to redo it on, on the virtual. He did it at our September 25th live event. Um, Tinkercad is an object-oriented graphics program where you basically start with objects like a cube or and you put it in and you marry objects together uh freecad is a i use freecad here freecad is a different kind of program you draw things in two dimensions and you extrude them to three so you actually have to have much more of a drawing capability um just to give you an idea in freecad of how this is done um you kind of see this over on the on the left um it starts off with basically a box that is the size of the wall and that's extruded out to the, that six inch thickness, which by the way is 6.35 millimeters. Most of the stuff is in millimeters. You get really good at converting inches to millimeters, your given scale. 25.4 uh, millimeters is an inch. An inch in, in O scale is four feet. So if you divide 25.4 by four, you get the millimeters for a foot. Uh, very quickly, you kind of figure out these dimensions. Uh, the way this works is basically you create that flat frame, which is basically think about it as a wall that's a solid wall that's six inches thick, that in this case is six inches, you know, it's, it's six scale inches thick. It was six inches long. 
which basically, if you think about it from a scale perspective, that's 24 feet, right? So our six, it's six times four. And then the height, and these were all built, I think, to about a 10-foot height, if I remember correctly. Um, then what you do is you basically use the concept of uh, a hole or, you know, essentially removing material to clear out in between. And then if you look down here, each one of the studs is actually a separate object that's added in. You can kind of see that if you look at the bottom of the studs, you can kind of see where they overlap with the bottom. So it's actually designed to kind of replicate exactly what a wall would be. Now, the cross supports here, you'll notice, are actually laid into the wall, but they only go about halfway through. Um, I'll show you at the end a, a second building I built later that's a smaller building that actually I moved those to being on the face, and I think that looks better. And if I was to redo it, I would put those on the face. Um, it turns out you have to print it differently. Um, when you do it this way, you can print it face down where the interior face which is what's facing us in this dot design is actually printed down on the print bed. Um, if you put those on the, the face there, you have to print the backside down on the print bed. And what you do is you end up with supports under those, but they pop out pretty easily. Um, and by the way, if anybody has any questions, just, just ask. Um, this is basically what that same wall looks like in Cura. Um, so basically if you haven't done 3D printing, uh, 3D printing basically has kind of three steps. Step one is you design an object in a 3D graphics program or go grab it off a of Thingiverse or whatever you want to do. Um, that generates an image that's called an STL image, which is basically a definition of the shape that's a general definition. Um, you then import that into what's called in the, in the filament world a slicing software package that actually slices it into layers that get printed. Um, this is Cura, it's pretty popular. It's the one that comes with the Ender 3 that I bought. Um, it, basically what it does is it slices it. Um, what I did was I put it down. The one you put down on the print bed tends to be a, a finer finish um, and that allows the space behind the braces. Like I said, later when I did the second building, I changed that around and I think it probably turned out a little bit better and you'll see that when I show you that design. So basically, this is what you get. Um, you get a bunch of wall pieces. So kind of if you ever built, if you, it, it's kind of interesting. If you've ever built a craftsman kit where you built wall framing or you scratch <coughs> work framing or did wall framing, we're basically doing exactly the same thing. We're just not doing it in wood. <coughs> so what you see on the upper left is the, in, the side walls. That's the, the front wall you saw. It's three pieces. Um, if you look at the middle picture on the top, you'll see that the wall pieces all have a hole in the end. Um, what you do is take a piece of copper wire. I think I used probably about 18 gauge, maybe 20 gauge, a um, little chunk of copper wire, stick it in there. Um, I used epoxy, just epoxy those two pieces together, use the pins for alignment. And you basically, what you see at the bottom is those three pieces now glued together to form a solid wall. I forgot to bring the wall up here. I have one. And I, I for a long time, I was taking it, showing it to people and waving it around. And finally, um, one of those epoxy joints cracked after about a year. So very solid in terms of, of the epoxy joints. You kind of see putting it together at the bottom. It's also aligned on the ends where the side walls and the, the, the back, and, and back and front walls tie together. Um, as I looked at this, I said, I got to put some trusses in it. Um, what I ended up doing was, as you see in the bottom picture there, there's a little alignment pin set that's bolted into the wall for the trusses. Um, I actually did all of those so they are able to have a pin inserted in them. And that pin's actually, as you see, kind of that very middle picture was designed to be able to insert it and remove. Uh, it actually turns out that when I got done and put the wood on the outside, that those trusses actually are tight enough that I don't think I really need the pin. Um, what you see at the, the right is, is kind of a point in time where I got done, I'd printed all the trusses, I was looking, I was getting all excited, and then as is usual when I build things, it hit me that I totally forgot about something. So what did I forget about in that right picture that doesn't work very well? It's lighting. There's no good way to do lighting. And so what happens is, as usual, when I hit one of these things in a modeling, caused me to go think about it for a while. And the conclusion of that was, why don't I print lighting right on the trusses? 
So what you see here is actually the redesigned trusses. Um, these print down on the print bed. Like if you look at kind of this middle center picture on the bottom, that's how it would print down on the print bed. Um, those 45 degree supports that support the bars that come out that support the lights print just fine like that coming up off the print bed. Um, there's a little bit of jagginess to them, but it turns out, and I'll tell you, in the finishing technique, you don't see it. Um, I found the lights. These are lights that come, I think, obviously from China. They have an LED in them and a little light thing. I think I bought 10 of them for 12 bucks on eBay. Um, what you'll notice is that the, uh, the, the castings actually have cast into them tracks there for two brass rods. And the brass rods feed, in, feed from either side of the truss. And actually, if you look really closely at the truss on the right, on the lower right, the one that's actually completed, they all have a built-in resistor on each one. So the idea is each truss becomes kind of a light mechanism. One side of the house is plus, one side of the building is minus. And by connecting up to those two, you can just wire across and, and do the, uh, the lighting across. Um, you kind of see a picture up at the top of it printing. You can kind of see it printing those, um, those alignment holes for the brass wires. Um, so this is kind of how that turned out when you actually look at it. Um, there's another little truss piece there in the front that matches the, the front um, part of the house. A lot of, a lot of figuring out very interesting geometric dimensions in doing this stuff between us. It really causes you to think a little bit. Um, you can kind of see a little bit better the trusses. I 3D printed um, all of the gussets as separate little objects, and they were all painted and a little bit of rusty, rust weathering and went on. Um, and then the lights are just connected in and soldered into the, uh, the brass wires that are there. So again, you know, the idea here is to do something that is a very solid, it's not gonna break, but when you look at it, you're hard pressed not to see it as being, you know, a, a wood or wood type object. Um, just a couple other pictures of things from a, a build perspective. There is an office on one end. Um, that's actually, again, three 3D prints. Um, then filled with wood, lined inside and painted. And you can kind of see what it looks like from both inside and outside. Um, and it kind of replicates a little structure in, inside in the building. Um, so the really important part of this, or uh, kind of the most challenging in some ways was, okay, now you've got a gray plastic building. How do you make that look like something that's not gray plastic? Um, so this is kind of the, the technique after a while came down to. So the, the first thing, um, and I, I don't remember where I, I saw this to start with. I saw something on this, but there's a thing called filler primer. You can buy it at Home Depot. Um, you use it on a car. If you've got a little bit of a wavy surface, you spray it on and sand it, and it fills enough to sand things smooth. Um, so what I did was took those, those pieces and sprayed them with four coats of surface primers. So just put them on a board with some masking tape, spray them, let it dry, spray it, let it dry, spray it, let it dry, spray it, let it dry. Um, what that does is that builds up a layer of this filler primer paint. Um, then what you can do is use whatever you, kind of whatever tools you use. Um, I use a razor saw a lot. I actually have a tool that, um, that actually Frank designed, Frank Sun designed, which has seven exacto blades in a holder, and you can drag that and do wood graining. So what you kind of see at the in that center picture there is that's kind of what the wood graining looks like after you get done with the filler primer and scrape it. You actually get pretty good wood graining. What's interesting is that's the surface that was in these prints down on the print bed. So the side walls, if you look on the sides of that, those were printed as a series of layers. And it turns out the series of layers have a little bit of undulation to them. So when you look at the side, it actually looks like it's almost got a wood grain in it from the layering when you print this that way. So it actually turns out both the, the front side you see gets nice wood graining, but kind of if you look kind of at the side, which is not exposed out into the building on the inside, you get a little bit of wood graining as well. So the wood graining was added that way. Um, I kind of, the, the walls and the, the wood, the wood on the walls was finished and I was trying to get what I would think of as, as aged interior redwood. Um, so redwood would have been the wood they would have used for most of this that was readily available up in the hills there in that area. Um, the coast redwoods, 
Um, when it ages in turn, it doesn't turn gray. It's not like uh, when it's exposed outside to the weather. So kind of trying to get that slightly reddish brown. Um, so it was dyed with brown and mahogany shoe dyes um, with alcohol. Um, and those were dyed individually before they were, were put on. Uh, for the framing, what I decided, I tried doing some light wood and then trying to get the coloring in the um, dry brushing. And I just wasn't able to get a repeatable result I liked. Um, what I found was at, um, at, at Home Depot, this Rust-Oleum, which is actually a, uh, it's called caramel. Now it's not matte, it's a semi-gloss paint. Um, but what I found was by, by spraying that caramel on and using that as the base coat, then I could use different dry brushing and dry brush it with, you know, light. you see just a whole bunch of colors there. And you see in the picture on the right, I used some craft paints and I used some Vallejo paint um, and did some dry brushing. By the way, just before this, I bought a set of what are called the Army Painter um, dry brushes. They're on eBay. I think it was about 25 bucks for a set of four of them. Um, if you're doing a lot of dry brushing, I would recommend those. They really are pretty good dry brushing, um, dry brushing brushes. So essentially it's just playing with the dry brushing, doing different layers, doing different colors and just continually coloring it. Um, so after the walls were finished that way, you now have a basically a finished box um, the exterior siding was was um, essentially put on. Um, I put most of this on. I've started using canopy glue for most everything. I've kind of like I really like the way canopy glue works. A little expensive, but it works very well. Um, so what you basically had was boards that were then glued on the outside. Those were then stained a little bit with black ink stain on just the outside after they were put on. And then again, they were dry brushed. This is just acrylic. It's uh, artist tube acrylic, the, the cheap stuff from Michaels. Um, and then after it got done, did uh, quite a bit of wire brushing on that to get more, uh, more effect of kind of trying to get the idea of a building that has been painted, not that painted reasonably recently is reasonably well maintained. Um, so that, so if you kind of look at the bottom left, that essentially is the building put together where you can just pick it up and move it around as a framework, which again, if you've ever built a craftsman building that actually had framing, you know, picking it up and moving it would be frightening because it would just fall apart in your hands. Uh, but again, this is all fairly solid when you get done because it's, it's all built out of essentially plastic. Um, the floor is actually directly onto, the, um, onto that masonite piece that has the alignment block underneath it. Um, it was done just using scribe siding. Um, I did a little tool. I took a picture of that because I thought it worked out really well. I, I ground the tip off of an X-Acto blade and made a little tool that was exactly the right width to cut um, board cuts in it, um, put in nail holes. Uh, what you'll notice in the upper left picture is the best place to see it is that was actually put onto the masonite before the building was put on. So it was actually cut and designed exactly to the interior size of the building because it was all glued together. The framework was glued together. And the picture at the upper right is actually epoxying the 3D printed framework onto the floor that now includes the finished finished flooring, et cetera, on the base. Um, so basically this is kind of what it looks like as a removable building. You see the hole over on the left. Um, I have a little board I built with some alignment guides to carry it around in a box. So it can be moved easily. And then it just drops in on the right into the hole. And you kind of see the pier on the front. I see a have pictures in a minute that show a little bit more done. But basically that's, you know, when you get done, the building fits in very well to the base. And you can kind of do all the, the landscape, the, the ground cover landscaping right up against it. Um, the other thing that, that was probably in many ways, I, I almost look back on it now as being a huge accomplishment. I'm not sure. I know I could replicate it, but I wouldn't want to try that easily, was to create the roof. So the roof is actually created out of a bunch of, again, printed sections. Um, the upper right is actually the middle section on the back side. So if you look at the left picture, you'll see that middle section is the top on the back side in the middle. Um, the end pieces actually have gussets, the two, two 
in six and six inch sections have gussets in, built into them. Um, and after a lot of um, work and getting angles down, I actually got all the angles down right for the, the roof that goes over that, um, that peak on the front. Um, so basically this was all laid out as individual pieces, then all epoxied together. Um, and this is kind of what it looked like back in May. Um, I put some siding on to take some pictures, but you can kind of see the roof on there, um, all the lights in. I actually connect all the lights up at that point to take some pictures um, to get an idea of what it, would, what it looked like. Um, and I showed this picture at the beginning, but this is kind of the same time frame in terms of pictures. Um, the roof was actually finished. I decided to use corrugated siding on it. Um, I like the Northeastern siding. It's a little heavy for O scale. Um, but the challenge I've done it with, where I've done it myself, um, using, um, just simple aluminum foil. I've got, you know, the, um, corrugated plastic from, I think from Northeastern, from one of the plastic companies, you use a, a piece of balsa wood and you can create your own siding. It's really pretty flimsy. Um, the advantage to Northeastern is it's, it's reasonably solid when you cut it. So what you see there on the lower left is kind of a flat car of siding that showed up. Um, the siding was all cut just using a square to cut the, the links of them and make them the right length. Um, everything was painted with a light gray. I, I finally found a fairly light gray um, primer, just basic automotive, all rattle. I use a lot of rattle cam paints because in this in O scale, it just makes a lot more sense than trying to do this with an airbrush. Um, so those were basically all um, painted. Um, and you actually see the picture on the on the sawhorses was actually a first rendition of gray, which I didn't like. It was I thought it was too dark. Um, and then I used Dr. Ben's weathering and rusting at this point, and then after get done, give it a coat of um, clear of clear coat, um, dull coat. Uh, the frame again was dry brushed. This uh, this was a fairly major task to go through and dry brush that whole frame and and get all the pieces put together. Um, so with that, then I installed the trim on the roof. This is all again, pretty basic. Um, you know, you, the trim pieces are again, all stained. Then they're dry brushed with the white to get it again, trying to match that idea of a weathered, but, but not, you know, not derelict kind of building. And those are actually glued on. So the roof, when you look at it from the outside and you see this a couple of pictures, you're actually looking at all wood trim. The part that's plastic is fairly well hidden, hidden when you do this. Um, so this was some pictures of putting the siding on the roof. Um, one of the things that's interesting here is you'll notice in the upper left picture, if you look kind of underneath the roof, you'll notice that that's the plexiglass building that I built originally. Um, it turns out that's an absolutely wonderful tool to hold the roof when it's not on the building. So I'm, I'm actually going to keep that, keep that around as a, a way to keep the roof from getting damaged. Um, so these are some kind of shots of the roof. And again, I think it's, you'd be hard pressed if you didn't know better to think, to understand that that roof was actually a, you know, 3D printed framing underneath. Um, again, some close up pictures of kind of the finish. Uh, the lower left picture, by the way, that notch that you see there on the side is actually where one of the trusses sticks out. And when this picture was taken, the trusses weren't in the building. The roof was just put on the building without the trusses being in place. Um, so the other thing was the doors. Um, decided I, I did a lot of thinking about the doors. And the problem I had was if I put the doors on the outside, when you took the building off, it was really, really easy to damage them. And so I decided after a lot of thought to make the doors open inward. And if the doors open inward, then you can just put them in place. Um, the doors were actually all built up just as, you know, individual pieces. And then uh, I put some hinges on them, which is some brass rod, and put them in place. And they, they look pretty reasonable for that kind of time frame. Um, on the back side, because I've got a fairly narrow platform there inside, having in opening inward opening doors didn't make sense. So I actually produced sliding doors for the back. Um, so those were actually all, again, 3D printed. Um, so you see the parts up there at the upper left. There's a, a tray on the top that has a rod in it. 
Um, there are these very thin, they're printed at about 0.8 millimeter thick. They're incredibly thin little hangers that have a little piece of the top that slides along the rod. And what you see at the right is those doors actually installed, the sliding doors on the building. Um, this is a few pictures of, of how those doors work in case you wanted to build this. One thing I found, which if you, if you want to do anything sliding like this, the picture on the upper right, you can't really tell, but that little rod that you see in there is actually a rod for model airplanes and is actually a carbon fiber rod. And it turns out carbon fiber is really kind of naturally slippery. And these doors just slide very nicely along that rod. Um, so this is basically what those two buildings look like now on the module. The, the pier is coming together. Clearly, there's a lot more details that have to go on this. Um, but it, when you look at it from the outside, it's a very, I, I think, clean looking nice building. And, it, and what it does is it captures, you know, again, that look we saw in the photos of those low slung buildings you know, across the way. Uh, one thing that was very interesting in all those photos was that there really was, um, there really was no, um, there really was no um, signage on the outside of the buildings that I could see. I went and tried to look very closely and it just appears because this was an industrial area where I don't think there was a perception there were consumers, there really was not much advertising. So the outsides are going to be pretty plain, pretty much like this is here. By the way, the windows on this are all are all um, tissue windows, uh, the window frames that I just and I basically designed the three D uh, walls to fit the windows. Um, just another couple of shots uh, of the buildings and how they look, and again, kind of in the bottom right, you can see where these are in the module now that you've kind of seen them. Um, so kind of the last, last thing I wanted to cover was I, because this is a sugar warehouse, I need to have sugar in the warehouse. Um, turns out sugar comes in sacks. At this time, that was how it was moved. So I, my project I've been doing on this, and this has been kind of a bit of a, uh, a blockage for me, was how do I come up with something that represents what the sugar would have been? So my first thought was you print a 3D printed box and cover it with sugar cubes. And what you see at the upper left is I bought the uh, Grantline, um, Grantline sugar or sacks. Uh, you can buy 20 of those. I built up a casting of those. I probably cast a thousand sacks trying to figure out how to do this. You see that at the upper right. I um, started gluing those on and doing them. The problem was that I couldn't figure out how to put sides on the stack. Um, and I ended up actually going and doing that separately. Um, then when I got that done, I realized I had to have a way to get the sugar sacks up on the stack. So this is actually what I'm building now, which is going to be a stack of probably 3,000 sugar, 3, sugar stacks at this point, um, which will have a ramp and have some wood on it. And I've actually got some figures and they'll be with, uh, with carts carrying sacks up to put them on the stack. So the idea is, you know, the sugar's moved in and stacked in the warehouse. You have a couple of cars on the sidings, the ship shows up, it all gets loaded on the ship and disappears, and then you refill the warehouse. Um, I want I put this in, this was actually not in the clinic I did up and uh, up in March or in May in May last in May or last year, uh, because actually this was done after that. So this is a second building I did and actually used the same techniques on. Um, this is the standard oil um, wharf. So this is again modeled after that standard oil wharf that is on, um, that was in Monterey. Um, and actually it, it's a pretty cool um, piece to model. This is actually some real pictures of what it looks like, looked like. Um, it turns out that this community, the fishermen were to a great extent Sicilian slash Italian. Um, what they would do is they would have a family day on the boat and invite all their friends on the fishing boat to go out for a trip on the boat. When they did that, they would tie up at the standard oil pier and they would take pictures of the boat. And the reason these pictures are taken this way is the pier was kind of a U shape where there was another pier and you could get over and take a picture from, a, from the other side and from a camera. So if you look at the little pier here, it's actually built that way where you can actually get to the other side and take a picture. Um, 
quite frankly, because of just the space limitations of a two foot, three inch wide, two foot, four inch wide module, um, I had to do some compression. So what you see is some compression on the, the picture there in the center of the, the length of the overall building. Um, but what I did try to do, you can kind of see in the upper picture, the coffin tanks there and the circular tank, the oil tanks that were on the pier. Um, also, you can't really see in this picture on the far right, the pier kind of turns and there's actually a track there with a place for a tank car. So I actually turned this into a spot for operations as well. Uh, so this is actually that building and this does, uses all the same techniques except the walls are not six by six. They're actually all framed to standard two by four framing sizes, two inches by four inches, not today's, which are what one and a half by three. So they're actually two by four. Um, so if you kind of look at the, the pictures here, um, the, the left picture is really the completed model on the pier. Um, what you see is there's a light bar there kind of that goes across. Uh, you'll see a picture of that on the next one. Those are actually 3D printed light shades with little micro LEDs in them. Um, I tend to do the same thing, run brass rods on both sides. I actually am going to put exterior lights on this. They're not on it yet. Um, but one thing you could do, if you look on those walls and look down where you see the aluminum siding, and look where the studs are and you'll see gaps. So these walls actually have three layers of depth. So they have furring strips that run horizontally that are on the outside, which is what you would attach the aluminum siding to. They have the studs which run vertically as the next layer in. And then the next layer in is the, is the angle supports, the, the, the uh, shear supports, and they're actually molded on the top of that. So you actually get three layers if you look really closely there, you'll actually see there are three layers of depth. So it actually gives you that much more feeling of the way a building feels that it's very open. Um, if you look on the right, there's the roof. The roof was actually built as a removable single unit. Again, it's all 3D printed. Um, so this is just some pictures of the assembly process for that building. Um, what you see at the upper left is you see all the pieces for the building. Um, the four pieces on the left there, on either side, those are the furring strip layer. The next layer is the stud layer with the, uh, the angle supports on top of that. Um, then there are the roof pieces that actually support the roofing, the cross pieces, the sign on the roof. And then because I was doing painting at this time, you actually got the windows. Those are tissue windows and the door again. Um, you kind of see some assembly um, on the bottom left, basically the Furring strips were, were glued to the wall. They were, they were all finished separately. Then they were glued together. Then those were glued together to form a box. Um, the little picture is kind of to the, the right of that. That's actually the lighting frame being assembled. Um, see the picture kind of in the middle there gives you an idea of what it looks like when you look in through the door and actually see somebody inside with the lighting. Um, bottom right, I actually put a little 3D printed um, jig together to assemble the roof. Um, getting those pieces to align properly and glue them together, I decided it was a lot easier if you had a little frame. Um, the floor, by the way, is just um, is just a, a piece of, uh, of some, uh, is actually not, it's actually individual boards glued together with cross pieces and then glued on the bottom. Um, so kind of to close, I, I did do some, some printing of this with smaller wall sections. So these are actually O scale and HO scale two by four framed walls with the cross pieces. Um, I don't have one here to show you. I probably should have brought that with me, but I didn't think about it. Um, so this is kind of how they look. So what you see on the, the right one there is HO, the left one is O. Uh, in HO, quite frankly, if I was gonna do this in HO, I've been using a 0.4 millimeter print head. Um, if I was going to do this in HO, I'd probably drop to at least a 0.3 millimeter printed, maybe 0.2. Um, it increases the print time significantly, but but generally we don't care too much about about how long print time is. Um, so kind of close uh, some just learnings, regrets, thought processes. Um, printing makes sections smaller, make things reasonably smaller. You can glue them together and build them up. Um, having done this for a while now, the gray filament prints crisper. The more colors you seem to have in filament, the less crisp the printing is. Um, 
want to print it flat, obviously smaller sections down. The side grain, interesting enough, looks really does look like wood, so you can use that to your advantage. Um, when things warp, you can't really heat them. Um, what I found now is, since I've done this, that if you do need to heat it, the best thing to do is fill a bucket with hot top water, and it's almost enough to where it heats up the filament to where you can start to move it. If you look at the picture on the right, that big piece that's kind of on the bottom left that looks a little wavy, that's what happened when I put it in the oven at 135 degrees. Um, it just basically turned into mush. Um, the filling primer is most important on the visible surfaces. You really need to do that. Um, dry brushing is really important. I, I still need to get better at dry brushing, even though I've done quite a bit of it. Um, I tend to be very impatient when I do this stuff and want to do it really fast and need to slow myself down. Um, I was concerned about the semi-gloss paint and about it would look semi-glossy. And it turned out after I got done with the dry brushing and that, it doesn't look glossy at all and not bad. Um, some changes, I, I would rethink the base and floor. If I was to do this again, quite frankly, I would probably 3D print the floor, the floor joist as a unit like I did the roof. And I would, instead of building a box, I would put magnets into that and put magnets to hold the building in the right place on the uh, on the module on the layout. Um, I I was not as accurate with the window dimensions in CAD as I should have been. You can measure the windows and add on a millimeter and make them that size and they'll fit accurately in. I had a little bit of play there, which I was a little unhappy with then, but I was not worth going through and reprinting all those walls. Um, I made the roof members a little larger than I probably should have. Um, I decided it wasn't worth going back and trying to redo it. Um, the wiring, the way I did it, the trusses will not, the wire, the lighting trusses will not be removable. Um, I actually molded, and you kind of see this in some of the pictures, I molded little pieces that clip on the wall that are wire guides to run the wires to a central location. So once the wires are installed, pretty much those trusses can't be removed. Um, and then I, there are a few other things. After I did this, I started playing with more fine printing and the gussets are a little, they're a little rough. They would have been better at, point one, at one millimeter. And I probably would have done them with a 0.3 millimeter print head instead. So basically that, that was the, the clinic. Um, I thank everyone. Any questions, comments, thoughts, et cetera? Couple things, uh, Phil. Yes, sir. Um, the uh, I, as far as the magnets go, I highly recommend that. I used that for uh, uh, background flats on our club layout, so that they were removable. Yep. Put the flat, put the flat up, put the glue on, or put the glued the magnets to the backdrop, and then I actually put wax paper around the base of the of the building and scenic right up to it yep and then take the wax paper out the building can come in come and go and, and the scenery yep. hides hides the joint and so that that sort of thing works very well um as far as that you're talking about the trusses i got to thinking did you consider having the lighting trusses remain on the base and have the ones that don't have lighting on them be part of the roof so that you could just lift the roof off and not have to worry about uh, adjusting the lighting. Yeah, it, so the, actually the, the ones that don't have the lighting, so if you, if you look at the trusses, um, hang on, let me see if I can find a picture here and I can share it and I can show you what I'm, there, I think there's one that has, yeah, here, let me, let me share again. So actually, let me do this. Let me share my screen. I was actually sharing the the video image of the app, but if I share the screen, then you can see my mouse and see my pointer. So if, if you look here, this truss has lighting and you, you see the wire right mm -hmm. here. You can actually see the wire hanging out. So this truss will be fixed. This truss here doesn't have any lighting, so it can just be popped out mm -hmm. and they pop out really easily. Um, like I said, I didn't put the pin in here. I, I found what I found. If you if you look here closely, right here, you can see that there's actually a piece of wood um, 
So remember, there was a piece of plastic on either side of these truss pieces that held them in place. Between that, I actually put the wood. There's open, you know, behind this, but there's a piece of wood there. Mm -hmm. So the wood actually, I made it tight to where, and so the truss actually squeezes down in the wood. So if you kind of look across the building, the way it kind of works is you've got a light truss here at the end. The first truss is a light truss. This truss, the, the next two trusses here don't have lights. And then the three middle trusses have lights. So you can move half the, these two trusses, four of the trusses can be removed right now very easily. The challenge with putting them on the roof would probably just trying to get everything to align. Um, the way the roof sits on, the roof just kind of drops on and just sits very naturally on it right now. So, and okay. part of it was just the structural way, but, you're, but that would be the other way to do it. it would be to just put the trusses on the roof and, and do it as part of the roof. So are you are you planning on submitting this for your prototype modeler? Um, yeah, I, I'm. I will probably do that at some point. I'm when I get when well, I get a little bit farther along. Yeah, I just it's it's looking wonderful for that. The other question was, I know there's some some people out there that have uh, wood filament. Have you tried using that instead of plastic? I, I have not tried the wood filament. I I haven't heard great things about wood filament from people that have used it um in terms of uh, how it looks how it works etc and, and i and my kind of feeling is but i think for the modeling the painting painting and finishing actually give allows you to control things a lot better i think in the end the wood filament you're going to end up painting over it it's going to be really hard to get it to stain to the level you want it's kind of my feeling but i haven't used it okay let me i don't know let, let me uh let me i'll put you in, in touch with uh, mike mackey who is the western region director who it, it has a lot of experience with uh, wood filament, and yep. uh, you you guys would uh, would, yeah, would and, uh, and, like that. And that 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 would be another option. I mean, if you could use do the wood filament, mm -hmm. that would actually work out great. So mm -hmm. also uh, this Tinkercad uh, clinic that you're talking about, I'd love to make that a, a joint clinic between the two divisions. Cool. Yeah, I, I, Fran was here, and I think he I think he dropped because I don't didn't see him here when I went back and looked. He was here <laughs> earlier, but I think he's seen this before. So um, I will definitely talk to Fran about it because Fran, Fran, if you haven't seen what Fran Foley does, um, he does Foley locomotive works. He does a lot of ON3, um, 3D printed small locomotives and stuff. And he does all of his design in Tinkercad. And it's pretty amazing okay. what he does. So I, I, love, like I said, I'm pretty impressed that. with it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, just from an AP perspective, uh, remember that if you design, if you create the design for the for the item, like you created the the, yep. the CAD drawing of the of the wall section, uh, then it qualifies as a scratch built part. So yep. that has uh, there five to ten years ago there was a lot of um, miscommunication if you will amongst the ap people and yep. uh, a lot of people got got seriously burned i believe and their feelings hurt and all of that and finally that's been been resolved yep. at least so for folks that don't know that if that's out there that's all i have and, and, and by the way if you're a, if you're a you know a highly detailed scratch built scratch modeler using what I'll call traditional components, you got to look at this go, it, it really is, there's a significant amount of effort in making this and getting it right. I, and, and between us, if you are, to, I would have a real argument with myself about whether it's easier to cut pieces of wood and glue them together or to try to do it in a CAD program and print it out and finish it. Um, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not easy. If you think about it, it and it, by the way, it takes a lot of thought process to make it all work. So, any other questions, comments? Well, I guess I we'll just point out that the second building you make that way would be a lot easier than assembling sticks of wood again oh, yeah. and again and again. I, you know, a absolutely. And, and one of the things that I, you know, I've been, I've done this clinic now a couple of times and I'm, I, I'm waiting for someone 
to do something like this as a kit. Right. Because I, I mean, again, if you stop and think about it from a kit perspective, you know, once you've got the walls designed, just like you do with a laser cutter, you laser cut the walls for a kit. You can 3D print the walls for a kit, put them in, have some instructions on how to do the finishing, and you can turn it into a, a pretty cool kind of craftsman kit kind of thing. Uh, quite frankly, I have no interest in doing that. So um, it's, uh, I'll leave it to people who want to be in the a hobby business. I, I just don't have any interest in turning my hobby into a business I've got to worry about. It doesn't seem to me that's a way to have fun. Bob, yeah, Bob go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Uh, am I unmuted? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I've been associated with uh, Vera Fosnight's uh, Wyoming Division Model Railroad uh, up in um, Pornville, uh, Arizona. Done all the passenger train operations. But uh, they have at least three 3D printers. They have a couple of filament printers and they have a rosin printer. And they've done some things like shingle roofs with etched shingles. And the detail from the rosin printer is just overwhelming uh, in HO. I mean, it's, it's some beautiful stuff. I don't know if they put any of this online. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff online about that layout and, and what they're doing. I, since they're modeling an actual place, Cheyenne to Ogden in the 50s, you know, they're doing buildings and stuff with the 3D printers. But, uh, uh, and there's lots of things online. I mean, you just do a search on the Wyoming division and so on. But yep. the thing that struck me was the the detail you could get with the rosin printer. Yep. Kind of a pain with the, you know, you have to have it in a separate ventilated place and all that kind of stuff. But uh, have you had any experience with the rosin printers? So I, I have not. Um, like I said, Fran Foley, who is kind of in the group that I'm part of as, as the modular group, Fran is kind of our, um, our, resident, uh, our resident 3D printing guru. And uh, he does a lot of resin printing, does some amazing stuff with resin printing. Um, I, I have just, I've, I've held off just because of the complexity and, and, and as Fran says, there's something to think about here, which is when you do this, it becomes another hobby. And so, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting that the more you do it, the more it becomes something that you end up spending a lot of time just doing resin printing or doing 3d printing. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, since, like I said, since they're doing an actual place, set of places in actual time, yep. you know, they've been a lot of, spent a lot of time on the details. Oh. But were there curb cuts in the 1950s for handicapped access and things like that? Yep. It's kind of a, I don't know, as an outsider, a bit of an outsider, I kind of look at it as sort of a rat hole that you can go down and down and down and down. Now they're doing a, a body for some kind of hopper car that the UP had a lot of that yep. isn't available commercially and so on. But, yep. you know, why not? <laughs> well, I, I, if you guys, if you're interested, I'll show you a, um, this is another little 3D printing project. And uh, so this is, and let me share the share screen here. Uh, so this is actually a turnout control. So this is a vertical slider. You just push it up and down. I think somewhere in here, I've got a video of how this works, but, but basically what that slider does, it moves up inside a, a bar. This little offset turns the you know, radial motion of the slider on the front, which is going up and down radially into a horizontal motion. That's coupled with a piece of, uh, quite frankly, a piece of, of uh, coat hanger um uh shirt hanger from the cleaners um and this is a fully 3d printed um turnout control for ho that includes a um includes a uh a, a switch for power routing and so this is kind of what it looks like that's kind of the the print head so this was kind of another project to create a um a turnout control that was manual um, it can be on the front panel of your layout. So if anybody's interested, by the way, those are just a bunch of STL files. You can print them and 
print a turnout. So it, basically, you can do a turnout for about two bucks. Um, the cost of the springs and the and the switch is about a buck and a half. It's about 50 cents for the 3D printed parts. So you can do turnout control for $2. Um, so there's interesting things you can do with it. That's the advantage of the filament printer. It's great for structural things. Um, you know, you can do uh, like, you know, give you an example. I give you another example here of, uh, this was a little simple tool. Um, let me share again. So I wanted to put paint on the top of my pier posts, like they painted the top of them, but I wanted to do it dry brushed so it was weathered. So this is about a 15 minute design tool that you basically drop the stick into, and then you can dry brush the top of it and you get a nice clear dry brushing line. So, I mean, one of the things about a 3D printer is it's, it's not just good for modeling, it's great to create a lot of tools for yourself. So I, for two hundred dollars, it's a fun toy. Mike or uh, Phil? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Cond Mike Condor in uh, Colorado put a request in the uh, chat for the link to the PDF. If you can ah, take care of that, I will put the when link you, when you for get a chance. Yep, hang on. The I will grab the link for the PDF and put it in the chat. It was actually in there. It's um, it's a tiny URL just called 3D Framing Clinic. So it's pretty easy, but I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. I also had a question. I might have missed it. How did you glue the wood to the plastic? What glue did you use? Um, so when I glued the wood siding on the wood boards onto the plastic on the outside. I used I used almost all. Um, I used I actually for that I used super glue. Try. I didn't use canopy. I just used thick super glue for that. Okay. Kind of been Thank using you. canopy glue and super glue more than anything else lately. Uh, yeah, it's in the uh, same, although I'm trying a rapid fuse right now. Uh, along with, uh, you know, Martin Breckbright has this concept of you take Walther's goo and super glue and use them together. And I don't know if you've done that, but that's for small parts. It's brilliant. You put you put some Walther's goo on one part, one side of the part. You put a little bit of, of super glue on the other side and stick them together. And they basically lock in place forever, almost immediately. It's pretty amazing. So thanks. You're welcome. Well, with that, I think we'll close on the clinic. And uh, so it's kind of time for any uh, anybody have anything they'd like to show that they've been doing. I the sharing is open. Anybody can share. Whatever you'd. There's something somebody would like to show that they're they're working on. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll go with a with a hint and tip uh, thing that uh, some of the people have heard, but I was absolutely amazed by, and that is WD-40 as hand cleaner. When you've been painting, it will take virtually any paint off your hands, acrylic, oil, whatever. Cool. Yeah, I have, to, have a, something to comment on. Uh, the pandemic has uh, really hit my model roading because I'm elderly and have underlying conditions. So about a year and a half ago, I bought a, a Z-scale layout from a friend. It's two feet by four feet. Z-scale is one to 220. And it's all branch lines, got some industries, bought a couple of passenger cars, heavyweights. Period is the 60s. So, guy's a great layout builder. And uh, figuring out how to do operations in Z scale um, with the tiny couplers and the cars that weigh essentially zero is uh, really quite a challenge. Anybody have any experience with that tiny stuff? That <laughs> I know this is off the subject, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of cute. I mean, it runs on. Uh, uh, eight to uh, AAA batteries and uh, and uh, so on. So, you know, it's something that sits there on a card table and I can, you know, do operations for 15 or 20 minutes in the evening. And, you know, and it's, it's kind of fun and handy, but it, it it's a pain. I mean, you cannot 
put the cars on the track without a trailer. I mean, it just, it's just impossible. So anybody been super small and have any thoughts on how you deal with that size? Bob, <laughs> would, you, uh, would you have ability to pull heavier cars? What I'm thinking is if you have enough uh, traction, I, I did a whole bunch, when I owned Litchfield Station, I did a bunch of, uh, I had a customer that was a Z-scaler and I, I did uh, decoders in Z-scale steam locomotives mm -hmm. until I got smart and said, no, I'm not doing any more of these. But um, I was thinking that you could maybe use uh, like tungsten, uh, which is denser than lead, to put a little weight in some of the cars and maybe keep them on the track a little bit better. But then I, I worry about the the traction capabilities of your locomotives. Well, it occurred to me, um, but the, tr the the trains are really small. I mean, you know, four, five, six cars is all. So I think that might work. I uh, probably need to try that. Uh, we're doing some work on the layout and uh, uh, adding some things and so on. So yeah, that's a good suggestion. It's on the list. As a Z scaler, it's like, yeah, I haven't tried the uncoupling yet, but I know there's, I have saw something, I'm like, oh, I'll have to try that. And I forget what it was, but, you know, using a very, very small, um, um, what was, it? oh, that's what it was. It was one of our clinics. And it's actually, if you use one of the, one of the micro brushes, you can actually take the tip off the micro brush yeah. and that fits right down between the Z scale and you can actually pull it apart. Because I remember yeah. we did that with, somebody else was talking about using it for HO scale. I'm like, oh, let's see, does it work for N? Does it work for Z? So I'm an N skater, Z skater, HO scaler. So it's like, uh, N, HO and three. So it's like, hmm, what works for which? So yeah, I have a there. friend here who's an expert at uncoupling tools. I thought I might pass the problem on to him. Uh, they couple up pretty good, but uh, the uncoupling is uh, <laughs> hazardous. Yeah. Phil, while there's a, a pause here, if I may, we usually uh, recognize within the division uh, AP things as part of our meetings. Oh, go for it. And uh, out of our November meet, we had um, a bunch of, uh, of merit awards and every merit award recipient is on the call today. Uh, Tim Gilliland, Gerald Mabry and Mike Starkey. And uh, Mike finished up his CARS certificate which we submitted to national with 10 merit award CARS. So, uh, that was that was super super work there, Mike and uh, Tim Gillen had a uh, uh, diorama similar to the kinds of things you were doing here today that uh, that won best to show. So um, cool. Recognized all those, and Gerald got a had a had a put in a really nice gondola that he that he scratch built while he's in William, uh, uh, Winslow. So. Should have had you guys set up to to share what you what you had there. That would have been good. You got a picture, you can share it. I've got some I can I can throw up here. Sure, go ahead. And, That'd be in 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 a minute or so. I gotta gotta get them found on my on my Mac. That's so. Let's go ahead and do something else and I'll dig them out. Has anybody else got anything interesting to, uh, to share or talk sure. about? Hey, Phil, it's John uh, Cockle. Can you see me? Hey, John, certainly can. can. Yes. Okay. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, very, very interesting clinic. Uh, it's amazing. You almost made me uh, want to convert from uh, N scale to HO scale with all that framing and all those in the structures. But uh, <laughs> Uh, there we are. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is what I was working on last night. I'm, I'm, um, I've got an op session coming up at the LD SIG, uh, I guess is what we're calling it there in a couple of weeks. Yep. And uh, I haven't had an operating session in about a year. So all, and I, I use a car card and waybill system. 
and the uh, cars are all scattered to the winds, right? Uh, and the, and so what I'm going to show here is is I don't know if you can see it. Last night I pulled out all the car cards and gathered them all up, and then tried to start assigning you know where the cards are. And and the reason I'm showing this. I guess I'm curious if anybody has a better system than just physically laying all these out and trying to sort them out, or if there's anything that anybody does to try to keep things organized a little more than, than that. So that's why I'm throwing that out there. It's a bit of a kind of like a, a Rubik's cube uh, and jigsaw puzzle all together, right? You have to kind of look for the cars and then look for this and, you know, this kind of stuff. So I just was curious if anybody had a, a better idea of trying to, to kind of keep that together. <laughs> doesn't sound like it huh i think that's a perennial problem when finding yeah. all the cars for an operating session well especially when you have a teenage son the cars go here there everywhere right and you know it's great that he runs the trains but we end up getting mixtures of trains and eras and everything and you know which is fun but at the same time it's it's yeah so okay no, 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 no uh, um, earth shattering ideas, but uh, that's great. So, so one thing might be to do if you're on the groups.io, um, if you're a groups.io member, there's the RyOps group on groups.io, which is the, basically it's the OpsSig groups.io group. And might ask there, John, that might be a great place to put a, a post up and ask for input on. I, when I, was doing the module, I actually did two things to get some operations input. Um, I took my original design to the, the Bay Area SIG meet, like we're doing in a week, and, um, and actually had a, a get together with one of the, the guys and he went through it and explained to me that my switchback to switch some of the tracks was very non-prototypical. <laughs> Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, we all look at the time saver as being this ideal switching thing. But in reality, a railroad would never do that um, because the inefficiency of doing that kind of switching would be whoever designed it would get shot. <laughs> um, so, so it was interesting. They gave me some good comments there. And then, but then after I did that, I actually did a write up and put it up on the RIOPS groups.io. And I think I had 37 comments. Um, and they weren't, they weren't, snot, there were actually some good comments. So for example, um, you did probably wouldn't have noticed this, but where the barge comes down, it, it comes from an upper level because it's the two and a half inches above the water level. It comes down to the level where the barge is. Okay. And, and the problem was when I originally designed that, I just had the track go down. I had a switch and it went to the barge and basically the comment, one of the comments came back and says, you can't take an engine on the barge. You have to have a couple of flat cars there as lead cars. Where are you going to park them? And so that led to putting a, another track down there, which is a place to park those, those two flat cars. Um, it also gives you a place to put a car while you're doing some switching there, um, deciding how you're going to bring cars up the hill. Um, so that was actually lots of very, very good input you can get. So I'd try that okay. one. Um, well, one thing. One thing I want to add, I guess, I, and then we'll go back to the other gentlemen. I, as I was going through the uh, the waybills last night, I was finding, and the one gentleman that was just talking about um, challenges, you know, as as we kind of get get up there in age and all that. I'm, I mean, I'm 57, but my eyes, I'm already starting to have trouble looking at the reporting marks on these end scale cars, right? Whereas a few years ago, it wasn't such a problem. So what I'm trying to do now, here's, uh, so I've got a, um, some of these uh, car cards are pre-printed and I'm starting to add things on here. Like this is a Sierra box car, but it's white and I'm starting to make notes on there. So it's the white box car because I've got a brown Sierra box car also, right? And trying to distinguish. So whoever's looking at this, they don't have to squint and try to see the number. I'll look for the white Sierra box car as opposed to, you know, SCRA 5009 or whatever it is there. But uh I've also seen some of the, the folks that, that put these together, I guess maybe they have more time. They'll, they'll put a little picture on here even, right? A picture of the right. car on there and print it on, which is awesome. Again, um, maybe if somebody has the time, but I was just curious if people had any ideas on the, the waybill. Um, and some of these are pre-printed and some of them like this, we, uh, we just kind of made up our own out of cardstock and, and that kind of thing, right? So a little bit of, of everything, but uh, I'm starting to find that... Uh, 
looking at these end scale uh, uh, reporting marks is getting a little more challenging there, right? So, yes, we keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. D Dick so. Stark's on here and he's got seven and a half inch gauge trains. So, that's when they get big enough that you can really see them. There you go. When you, when you can ride on them. Yeah, except they're expensive. <laughs> yeah, my son works up it's at kind of hard Dowie to... there in uh, in Tilden Park, which I think is what twenty inch gauge or yep, yep, twenty four. So yeah, he he wants to go bigger too. But uh, I said, well, it's better to have a job where they pay you to play with them as opposed to having to build them ourselves, right? So well, I started. Anyways, I started. Thanks, Phil. Uh, a great clinic. I appreciate it. It was good stuff. Well, thanks. Okay, I'm ready to go if that works. Go for it. Okay, well, here's Tim's. Um, that says it paused it on me. Okay. Come on, resume. No. Not coming up, Bruce. Well, it yeah. it, uh, it was yeah. It's still telling it. It's 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 uh, starting to yeah, share. I'm, I, I'm watching. I'm watching it on. I'm it, I'm doing it on my Mac and watching it on my iPad. And it's... Huh. It says that it paused again. You're trying to share the and program or the uh, or the or your desktop. Desktop. Okay. Hmm. Well, we'll 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 not do that. Some good looking stuff. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, we're gonna miss that. That's. Yeah, I know. I don't know why it wants to be so persnickety. You want to try one more time? Try the try. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to try sharing the uh, Finder window. And going from there, I tried opening them all. Yeah, if you and, share uh, the Finder window, all we're going to yeah. Okay. Yeah, the problem is when you open up the yeah, picture yeah. now. What what yeah, you want to do is sh share the window with the pictures. Share the window with the picture. That's picture. Why, that's. That's what I tried to do before. So we'll stop that and go over here and put that away. No, I can't put that away. Never mind. Uh, forget it. I should have been. I should have been better prepared. I would have put, oh, dropped well. them into a Sorry. into a into a keynote and been done with it. Anyone else have something to share? Is there anything to, to cover? Inter going once? Going twice? Well, Bruce, I think that probably brings us kind of to the end of everybody getting excited. It's time to go spend the rest of the day modeling or watching football, depending on your viewpoint. Does does Phil I appreciate uh, working this out together and let's do some more of these. Oh, this was very good. Yeah, and almost was... forty people here at the at the peak of the attendance. So no, this that's... was great. This was great, great attendance. And I, I think it was. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that the the clinic. Like I, it, it, as I said, it wasn't my intent to push a clinic from me. It was I'd agreed with Bruce to do this a while back, and we picked this date. And then when I restarted our clinic, our weekly meetings after Christmas, I did the first one on the seventh. And so that meant this was one of our meetings. And when Bruce called me and said, Hey, what about the 21st? It was like, well, we got two options. I or two or three options. And this seemed like a good option. So I think that's a, a good one. And like I said, I'll talk to Fran and see Bruce. Uh, maybe we'll try to do either the next one or the one after that, where we combine the two and we have Fran come in and do his clinic on Tinkercad. 
Hey, Phil. okay. The the um, third Saturday in April is available. If that works for you guys. Cool. I'll I'll look at that and then talk to Fran about if that one works. Hey, Phil. Hey, terrific. Yes, sir. Why don't you can do a clinic on some of the tools you've built for the ACCRS? A lot of guys would see like to see some of that stuff that we've done. Yeah, that's true. And it, you know, it's simple stuff. It's not, you know, uh, fancy stuff. Yeah, that's true. The point it is doing a building. Some fu some future future day. Yeah, yeah. Just an idea. Hit me. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Well, thanks Sorry. everyone. Thank I think Carol, we'll go ahead and you. go ahead and call it. And you all have a great weekend. And hopefully, we'll see you. And I'll have to think. I personally, I'll have to think about whether I want to make a trip to the Grand Canyon. Um, see you all in person. That'd be great. But uh, uh, make your decision quickly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a long drive. I've been looking at the national convention, and that's a long trip. Um, so, anyway, have a good one, everyone, <laughs> and we will bid you all adieu. All right. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, thank Thanks. you, everyone.